Hello, welcome back to Craft Aquatic. I'm Matt G. In this video, we will be taking a look at the new DIY Upflow algae scrubber I just added to the Craft Aquatic 120 gallon mixed reef. I'll show you how I built the wet side, the dry side, and how I wired the LEDs, all for under $45. This design was inspired by the Santa Monica hog scrubber and another DIY video I found on the subject. I'll put a link to both of those in the description below. Before we get started, please do take a moment to subscribe to Craft Aquatic and hit the notification bell. We release a new video on a variety of reef-related topics each month, and I believe we can all agree there can never be too many videos on the topic of reef keeping. When you support this channel, it motivates us to make many more. So with that said, on with the show. Over the years of owning and maintaining all variety of reef aquariums, I've come to accept that algae will always find a way to grow in a system, and that it is not necessarily a bad thing, so long as you provide a place for it to proliferate where it is not visually distracting. Turf algae can provide a valuable means of extracting excessive nutrients from a well-fed system. For myself, in past setups, the algae took residence in corner overflows, hidden away behind rock work, but in this setup it seems to want to grow in the dimly lit caves and overhangs, and there are plenty of them in this build. This is where algae scrubbers come in. There are all different varieties that have become very popular in the past several years, and I've decided to use these free food safe containers as the foundation for my build. I won't be needing the two plastic covers. The two sides measure nine by six by two inches and are the perfect shape and size for what I will be installing inside them, as well as the area I have free in my cabinet to mount them. As you can see, they're made of a solid, non-transparent material important for keeping the light inside of them as much as possible. They fit together like a clam, and they'll fit in the inside and the outside of the sump perfectly. Not bad for a couple containers I got for free at a local takeout joint. One of the other items that helped to keep my cost down was this pair of LED panels that someone had given me for free. And I had used them in the initial uh, scrubber build I installed them inside and they just didn't have enough punch, enough power to grow the amount of algae that I wanted them to as quickly as I wanted it to grow. So I decided that I would keep uh, one of them, cut them to size, and use as a heat sink that I could use to disperse the heat from the 5 or 3 watt LEDs, whatever I decided to install eventually. The LEDs came mounted on PCB boards. They were about $2 a piece. I bought three and five watt LEDs so I could choose later what I wanted to actually use. One of the more difficult things when building your own LED panel is choosing what power supply you're gonna use. Here we have a 12 and a 24 volt DC constant voltage power supply. One of them has variable output. Here we have the one I chose to use. It is a very popular choice in LED ballast. It's rated for up to 48 volts DC at the output and I think it was around 13 to $15. A circuit in parallel is typically used with a constant voltage power supply where the positive side of a properly rated DC output is connected to the positive input of the LED. That string of connections is continued down positive to positive, negative to negative, until the last LED in the chain is reached. In this beautiful illustration, we have a circuit in series where a constant current power supply such as an LED driver is used to connect the positive DC output of the driver to the input of the first LED chip. From there, we connect negative to positive, negative to positive until the last LED where we then connect the negative output back to the negative side of the LED driver. Now if that was at all confusing or not complete enough of an explanation, you are not alone. There are a number of reasons why you may choose one circuit over the other that we do not have the time to cover in this video. With that said, if you wish to educate yourself further, please follow the About LED Circuits link in the description below. There's some great info there. 
I ended up switching from those 5 5 watt LEDs you just saw me soldering to these 6 3 watt LEDs in series. It hit the sweet spot for power, cool running chips, and light spread over the entire heat sink, which by the way, you could use any type of sheet metal. Both will double as a capable heat sink and reflector. There are a variety of methods you can use to fix the LED chips to the heatsink. A lot of people will put thermal adhesive between them and then screw them directly to the board. But I chose to use this two-part epoxy and thermal adhesive in one, which should fix the LEDs to the board and provide a strong thermal bond. When mixing the two-part epoxy, in almost every case you want to mix in two equal parts, wear a pair of gloves. This stuff is pretty toxic until it dries. I'm not too concerned with the toxicity of the two-part in relation to aquarium compatibility since this will be on the dry side of the scrubber which will be on the outside of the sump. Now when applying it's best to use as little as possible and you want to yeah, ideally put a little bit on the board and a little bit on the chip but it's easier to put these in place if they are only on the chip so I put a little bit more than I normally would use to epoxy these to a surface so it does squish out the sides a little bit but I know that they're secure and what I had to do is kind of push them down until the epoxy dried it took about a minute. And after everything was dry, I flipped the LEDs on for 15 minutes to confirm a good thermal bond. Now if you install a switch, which I did not, you want to install a properly rated switch between the AC plug and the driver, not the driver and the LEDs, which may blow your chips. Looking at the dry side of the LG scrubber, you can see that I have used silicon to secure the heat sink to the container. I had to rough up the plastic quite a bit to get it to stay in place. The plate is suspended above the back of the to-go container, which allows for air to flow freely from the bottom out to the top of the container, creating a sort of convection current. This dry side being previously installed, I got to play around with the amount of holes needed to keep the board cool and settled on these two holes along with the ones in the top and the bottom to uh, provide optimal ventilation. Here an obvious but often overlooked strain relief to keep one from pulling the LEDs straight off the board. The wet side's a little grimy, having been previously installed, but I got it mostly clean so we can take a look at it here. So what we've done is we've zip-tied most of the internals into the food container so that they can't be pulled out. There is silicon holding the magnets on um, on both sides, and these are supposed to be waterproof magnets, but I really gooped it on just to make sure that they would not rust. It won't win any beauty contest, but I can tell you from experience, rusting magnets are a problem with many DIY projects and even boutique reef equipment. The green zip tie is strung across to keep this plastic mesh in place. And behind it, there's all this surface area as well as in front. And because the plastic mesh flaps around the way it does, the whole back and the whole front can fill up with algae and secure it in place so it doesn't float out of the algae scrubber. I bought the plastic mesh at a local fabric store. It came in a pack of 10 for under $5, and I only had to use a little bit of it. So again, showing how I secured everything with zip ties, there's three running across the zip tie bar. And then on either side of that zip tie bar, I used the nubs that actually secure the zip ties together to hold them against the body of the scrubber. And to reiterate, I was not trying to win any beauty contests here. This is an experimental project, and I probably wouldn't have used as much silicon on the outside of the container or the inside. I could have just gone with the zip ties throughout to secure everything in place, but I was being extra careful when I first put this together. Uh, would have looked a lot neater without all of it. The one hole in the top of the scrubber and the two in the sides are all that are needed to vent the air that comes down the silicon tubing, comes out the horizontal slit cut in that tubing, and flows up through the scrubber. And I left plenty of air line to reach my pump. Here are the impressively strong neodymium magnets that I used, purchased off eBay in a block of 12, and I ended up using four. 
Just some finishing touches here. I'm going to use my heat gun to secure the shrink wrap. I want to make sure all my connections are sealed and secure since this is going to be in a sump cabinet where there is water and electricity all mixed together. Having thoroughly tested my LEDs, driver, and connections for several hours, I am confident that everything is safe and secure, so let's move the scrubber upstairs to the main display. Our main display is a mixed reef with an emphasis on SPS. I'll put a link to a video about it in the description. I placed the scrubber on the floor directly in front of the cabinet. I've already decided where it and the driver will be mounted on the front of the 30 gallon acrylic sump. I'll be placing it in this spot to the right of the ATO reservoir in front of the protein skimmer and to the left of the GFO reactor, which you can't see right here. I built the cabinet slightly shorter than is typical, so when viewing the coral colonies, I'm looking at the tops rather than the base of the SPS. It's my preferred viewing angle, but it does restrict me in the amount of headroom above the sump, which is why this upflow skimmer is a great choice for my setup. When first dialing in one of these scrubbers and managing uptake later on, it is helpful to have it on a timer. I did not include the cost of this Coralite luft pump that I've had kicking around for 18 years. You can't kill these things. But any air pump that you have laying around will probably work with this build. So here it is, our Upflow LG Scrubber completely installed. By design, it fits in this spot perfectly with room to spare. I've tucked the LED driver away behind this cabinet support, but do plan on mounting it more permanently so it is up off the floor of the cabinet. I've placed this piece of translucent plastic between the LEDs and screen while the LG establishes itself in the scrubber. Once the LG is growing, you can remove it without the possibility of bleaching your newly established base. You can see here the air flowing from the slit cut in the silicon tubing at the bottom of the scrubber over the screen and up to this air gap at the top of the scrubber, leaving this space will reduce the sound of bubbling. I expect in a week to a month, patches of LG to start growing on the screen, followed by a full lush mat. Here my son is demonstrating how the front dry side and wet side snap together tightly with those powerful magnets we've installed. Overall, I've been very happy with my decision to add this DIY upflow scrubber to my system. It worked very well with the older, less powerful LEDs, and I expect it will grow LG even faster with the new 3 watt LEDs installed, hopefully, finally, keeping all the hair LG out of the main display. If you are looking for a natural method for exporting ammonia, nitrates, phosphates, and even some heavy metals from your system, it's hard to beat an LG scrubber. If you don't feel like building your own DIY upflow LG scrubber, you can always purchase one of these from Santa Monica Filtration. They have options galore, tiny to large, and they aren't that expensive, so I'd encourage you to check them out. As always, thank you for checking out Craft Aquatic. We make these videos for the reef keeping community. So if you appreciate what we do here, give us a thumbs up and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.